I mean, there really is. Um, I mean, even even the things in First Peter are. Um, it's just it's just giving him back something. It's not about what we get. And uh, yes, we do get in the in the in the flow of the Godhead, in the flow of the Father with the Son and the Holy Spirit, and the Son with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit with the Father and the Son. In that flow, <clears throat> the others are always giving, but you don't just become a taker, you know. Um, and I think that was one of the crimes, as it were, a bad choice of words, but of the Jews who they were meant to become a channel of all that God had to the world, and they became the object of it. They, that's it. It stopped with them in a lot of ways. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so... Okay. Uh, hey, Mike, would you do us a favor? Uh, turn your video off. That's not my my thing, but the technical people know better than me, which they do. <laughs> uh, but we are glad to have everybody on here. Alana, are you still on here? Oh, my goodness. Where's this baby? <clears throat> I'm going to fly down there and deliver it if I have to. Okay. So... Uh, Good to have all you guys. Um, and um, so last uh, last class that we had, last sharing here in, in per, pertaining to the firstborn, we um, kind of ended with talking about uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and it was verses uh, 6 through 10, I think, that we did. Hope you remember that. <clears throat> There was also, uh, toward the end, uh, I ask you if um, uh, you would now look over First Peter, and I particularly said First Peter 5, verse 6 through 11, because <clears throat> I wanted you to see if you could see any comparisons, uh, any um, familiarity between First uh, Peter 5 6 through 11, and uh, um, 2 Corinthians 12, 6 through 10. So we're talking about just a few scriptures. We're talking about just a few scriptures in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, and just a few scriptures in, in uh, 1 Peter 5. Uh, <clears throat> to see that within those few scriptures, could we find some common ground? Could we find some reality of what we've been discussing and talking about? <clears throat> and um, so I'm just going to ask if anybody did, and if you didn't, that's fine. <clears throat> uh, because I have some. <laughs> but if you um, just wondered if anybody really, uh, not just, followed through, but if anybody really followed through and went, huh, and saw some things. Um, now, I will say this. Um, you know, this whole First Peter thing that we had, this, this board actually behind me represents what I was teaching in First Peter. <clears throat> this whole First Peter thing and, and dealing with the sufferings of Christ for many, it was um, a difficult thing, uh, and I understand that because I had never seen it, and the Lord began to open my eyes, and I began to see it. Now I see it everywhere, and I see it in Jeremiah, and I see it in Isaiah, and I see it in Ezekiel, and I see it in um, uh, Genesis. Um, but I understand that, you know, there's... there's there, he that, you know, he that hath an eye, let him see. You know, it is it is the necessity of the Spirit of God to begin to open our hearts and our eyes to these things. And, uh, and of course, we, you know, 
we've had some other times where we shared and, and got some things out of it. But um, just to just to see, so I'm going to ask you if there's anybody that did, there may be only one person or whatever. I have a feeling you're not going to be fighting over who's going to talk first. But if anybody did, I'm going to give you a, less than a minute to uh, just pop in and and say something. Okay? All right. Ready? Your turn. This is Mallory, and I looked at it a little bit. But, um, well, just briefly, I really, honestly, it res First Peter resonated with me more with reference to what we've been looking at in Isaiah 8. Uh -huh. So that's where I felt like, you know, you humble yourself under when this, this thing happens, and you just let the Lord take care of it. And um, um, I don't know if this is a right um, correlation, but in First Peter, you are vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And that's kind of like trying to form a confederacy and trying to justify yourself and trying to defend yourself in some kind of way. And the enemy devours you um, that way. And then knowing that um, you're not alone in it, that there are, you know, the brethren, like the, the whole nation of Israel went into captivity. You know, it's not an individual um, dealing. But if we stay low and we and we let him be our Adonai, then he brings us back to the land, which is in verse 10 in First Peter. After you suffer, he makes you perfect. He establishes you and strengthens and settles you. And then to him be the glory and dominion, you know, because he gets to dwell in the midst of that. So that's, I, I'm sorry, I missed the, this cor uh, correlation with Second Corinthians, though. So sorry well, about that. Well, to be honest with you, you nailed some of them. <clears throat> you did, and that's good, and uh, that's that's just fine, because it's it's all of one. So, what? Can you say that again? Uh, apparently, I dropped out or something. I had you still on mute. For oh, okay. I'm sorry. So, so I was still on mute, which is probably the Lord. No, it was really good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the just uh, you know. For you, Mallory, uh, no, I, that, you know, you actually nailed Second Corinthians uh, 12 also. So uh, that was refreshing, actually. And it really is because, you know, all of this is, is Isaiah 8. And we're not quite finished with Isaiah 8. We'll probably, probably after this, um, pop over to, to Isaiah 10 just for a little bit. Uh, and then back to finish out chapter 8. So, you know, we're good. We're not finished with that. Anybody else have any correlation, particularly with uh, 2 Corinthians 12? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through some of these um, things. And um, as I said, uh, we don't just see it at first. If, we, if, if the template hadn't been formed in us, number one, it's going to be really difficult. But even with the template, sometimes it's uh, hard to compare that to something somewhere else where we've seen the Lord. Um, what I'm going to share right now is going to be contingent on everything that I, all of the, I, I think I have uh, seven examples of comparisons. And as we get down to the end, it will make more sense of what was said in the first couple of them, although I think that, you know, it's, I think we'll be fine. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and read <clears throat> 2 Corinthians uh, 12, 7 through 10. <clears throat> and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I sought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Okay, now 1 Peter 5, 6 through 11. <clears throat> Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. <laughs> la, la, la. Um, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfastly in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Jesus, by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So how many of you started picking up on some of that when I read them together? You go, oh, well, wait, there's this and oh, and there's that. And well, we'll go through them now. <laughs> Praise God. All right. Comparing 2 Corinthians 12 with 1 Peter 5. What are the common elements that these two sets of scriptures have in common? Okay. <clears throat> so number one, the devil. Okay, number one, the devil. All right. And we'll, the, the clarity of it being the same or, or a comparative uh, thing uh, will go more as we bring in more of these examples that I have here. So, the devil. There, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. That's 2 Corinthians 12, uh, 1 Peter um, uh, five. What is it? First Peter five is your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now we we may look at that and go, well, wait, God sent one, but the other one sounds like it's an adversary, not a tool. Um, <clears throat> but let's let's finish out the scriptures and and keep comparing them to see if. The result isn't the same. Now, God can use the devil. He can send him to you to, to, to deal with your pride. <clears throat> or the enemy, so, so the enemy on his own can just be an evildoer and attack you and maybe not even personally attack you, uh, but he could. Um, with the same results, God can still get the same results, which is more of his son, which is more of the lamb, which is more of that spirit. Okay, but, but I don't want to confuse you too much. So let's go to number two. Okay, <clears throat> the comparison of resistance. And this is going to be similar to the first one that I just said about the devil, that the clarity comes as we begin to see more and more and more of this thing. Okay, the resistance. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12. For this thing I uh, besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9. Whom resist steadfastly in the faith. All right. And so what we may end up seeing, not just here, but in other cases, is that our concept of resisting the devil isn't always just, I rebuke you, I've got authority, uh, Jesus is better than you, and he's greater than you, and, and you know, flee from me, because, um, because God, because, well, can I just say, because Paul, you know, your boy Paul there, that uh, everybody holds so highly, He's resisting him, trying to get him out of his life. And God may be saying he's, he's an evildoer or he's, he's using, he is my hand like Nebuchadnezzar or like the king of Assyria uh, to get certain things out of you. And therefore, resist steadfastly in the faith 
may not be what Paul was trying to do and had to be brought under, had to be humbled to see that there's another way that doesn't re require resistance, but you are resisting the devil. By, by what? Steadfast in the faith. Not faith to cast out demons, but faith to stand in the midst of the enemy attacking you and doing what Paul did, realizing this is of God and therefore, you know, and I'll get into the rest of that, his reaction to that in just a minute. So, uh, uh, ver uh, number three on my list is being humble to God, being humble to God. Um, that both of these have that element. So, um, in verse 9 in, in 1 Corinthians 12, he says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now here it comes. Most gladly, therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities. Okay, so Paul is resisting. You know, he, he's like somebody in the corridor that's resisting the corridor. Uh, who's resisting the sufferings of Christ, who has no clue about the sufferings of Christ. They just know, well, God's God and the devil's the devil. And, you know, if anything bad happens, it's the devil and we rebuke him. And if it's God, you know, he won't hang you on a cross or ask, of it, ask you to go through anything, you know, like that. He's, his job's to remove. Well, that's, a, that's an incorrect view of the fullness of who he is and what this is all about. Um, I've often said, if this was just a battle of the, who's the strongest, a god would defeat a fallen angel like that. He has been, he is kept around. God could have got rid of him at the cross or in the garden. He is kept around for God's purposes. All right. So, um, uh, so in uh, the, the comparison of hum humility toward God in uh, 1 Peter 5 is, Humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Hmm. I don't even think I got that part about exalting in here. Maybe I do. But they both have to do with exaltation. But one of them is someone's trying to exalt themselves. And the other one is God is saying, hey, resist the devil in the faith. Not, not just chase him off, but let him do what, he's, what I've sent him to do in you. Most gladly, therefore. That's humility. And that's in 2 Corinthians. Uh, 12. What is it? First Corinthians? Uh, yes, yeah, 2 Corinthians 12. Okay, so, so there's that humility aspect. All right. Number three, casting care upon the Lord. Um, uh, Mallory hit on this, and she hit on several things unknowingly that all this was still in here with, uh, with uh, 2 Corinthians 12. Um, it is at that point that Paul says, therefore, I will, he's fighting, he's resisting, he's resisting the evil one, he's resisting evildoers, he's, he's you know, this is just a, a mess, this is wrong, you know, why is this going on, why do I have a messenger of Satan, uh, why, why, is, why do I have a, a thorn in the flesh, and then when when God begins to talk to him about grace, which we'll, we'll hit down further, he goes, most gladly, therefore, because he sees that this is also the care of the Lord to answering the prayers that he's prayed, that he wants the Lord in nature, not just as a savior far away a long time ago, that saved him so he doesn't go to hell. This is, again, see, if we stay on that forever, we're a child. Because a child is always, give me this, give me that, take care of me, do this, do this for me. 
There's no maturity. And, uh, and any parent will tell you that once you become a parent, you become mature because there's a lot of suffering that goes along with taking care of everybody, especially, a, you know, I'll just say, especially a mother. Um, a lot of self-giving, a lot of loss, a lot of not having attention anymore. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so number four, experiencing affliction. Okay, they both have that, all right? Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distressions for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. So you're seeing that there are these, that, that it's like if there was no corridor, if there was no set actual reality of the sufferings of Christ, then... Um, you know, there wouldn't be, you know, there, in a certain sense, there'd be no purpose in afflictions. But, and let me just say, but for sure, for sure, when it comes to the sufferings of Christ, when it comes to what we call the sufferings, the corridor, um, what Peter calls it, uh, the sufferings of Christ, that then there is eternal purpose. And another there's another purpose that we'll bring up as we get down here too. But um, it's, you, you know, um, what does it say in, um, in the 2 Corinthians, uh, the end of it, four, chapter 4 there? It says that for this light affliction worketh for us, that the affliction is a worker for us while we look not at the things which are seen, which is what? The affliction. Don't look at it. With the things that are not seen, for the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Okay. So, plenty of scriptures in the Bible, in the New Testament, that bear this out over and over and over. It's the same patterns that we've been using here. <clears throat> All right. Um, uh, still with affliction, this is uh, 1 Peter um, 5, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. All right. All right. Now the influence of grace, the influence of grace. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, um, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. See, that's a completely different definition of grace. That's a completely different definition of grace. Because we see grace as God chasing off the devil instead of giving us a messenger of Satan. Um, but he sees it as you know, not de being demanded this toward God, not being demanded that he take this thing away, but asking of us that we gain his spirit in the midst of it. And when Paul saw that, he said, hey, that's it. I'm with you. Therefore, I will most gladly rejoice in these things. Um, so, uh, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness in uh, uh, 1 Peter. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto eternal glory by Jesus Christ. Okay, so you need to see that first, because you were, we didn't finish the sentence. But right now, we're just comparing grace for grace in the scriptures. But this is leading to something. But the God, the God of all grace, who hath called us unto eternal glory by Christ Jesus. All right, so let's go to what I have listed as number six. The sufferings have a spiritual benefit. Okay, so 
There's affliction in both of them. Uh, in Corinthians, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, will I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Okay, and then Peter says this. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Do you see that? Do you see that they're both ending with um, something new working in the person to whom these afflictions and these things are happening? Um, they're, they're not just uh, rebelling against everything that's negative because God uses the, God made the day and he made the night. And it doesn't matter to him. There are scriptures that say that. It's all the same to him. But it's not all the same to us. We want, you know, when it comes to trials and the devil and all this, we want uh, deliverance. We want rescue. And he wants us to give him something back. It's that same old theme forever that I will always emphasize. He wants something back and we, we can give it. But we'll have to go against, just like Paul did, against our reactions that this is bad, it's got to be bad, and this is the devil, and people are saying it's the devil, and so, uh, you know, it looks like I'm of the devil or something like that. And you go, you know what, I'd rather be with the Lord. I'd much rather be with the Lord than try to explain something to people that are, it's not in their heart. They just want rescue. That's all they want. All right. So, um, I love the last part of that uh, in Peter. After that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. You need to be settled. I need to be settled down. Settle down there. You know, you're riding a horse and it starts, settle down. <laughs> All right, number seven, this is the last one. <clears throat> the aspect of glory. Uh, in Corinthians, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Okay, so you see that the glorying, now, and we, we dealt with that in the corridor. I mean, this, this whole last section over here is where the glory takes place. There is the entering in and then kind of ambivalent and going, oh, I'm not sure, you know, where I stand and all this stuff. But then it's into the heat, but in the fiery furnace in here is where you make your stand so Christ can be seen instead of so Christ can jump down and, and deliver you out of it. And then the, the, this final box over here, which are all one quarter, is the third stage and that's where first peter really emphasizes over and over and over if you go through this uh, you know be not think it not strange about the fiery trial if you uh get you know get through this then this is going to result the primary thing that it's going to result in is glory to god so you go yes i will go through all of this if I can give you glory that will honor you if I can give you glory that will give you something you know we go I give you glory well you know it doesn't cost a whole lot to raise our hands and say glory 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 you know holy 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 you know, all that. <laughs> it doesn't cost much but this will cost and what did David say you know um, uh, the guy up there on the, I forget the, the threshing floor guy name, but what? Who? Ornan. Ornan. Ornan's threshing floor. And uh, and he, he said, you know, you're the king. I'll give you the threshing floor and whatever sacrifices you want. He said, God forbid, should I not, should it not cost me anything? That was his heart, see. That was his heart. 
we don't automatically go, are you kidding me? I'm not going to get deliverance in this situation. Is it not going to cost me anything? I want to be with him. I want to show the father, the son, and I want to show the son that, that I will get out of the way, you know, I, that he might live in me. And, you know, shall I do this and it not cost me? No, I won't do this. Well, okay, what was David accused of? Having a heart after God. That was his deal. That was his deal. And that's why he said stuff like that. That's why he said stuff like that. You know, he's always talking that way. <laughs> and we need to. You know, we've taken off more on modern day Christianity and the way every definition that it has instead of going, you know what, I think I'm going to read the Bible and find out for myself and I'm going to get into this thing and let God show me if there's a bunch of stuff that I'm doing wrong. All right. So, and then um, the glory part in First uh, Peter, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. To Him be glory. To Him be glory. See? To Him be glory. And dominion over my flesh. Over my soul reaction. Forever and ever. Amen. Ah. So. Um, la, 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 la. So, as I said, I was wanting to, to jump a little bit into um, Isaiah 10, because I felt like there were some more things in there before we finish out chapter 8. <clears throat> um, so, my statement between uh, not just this, not just this class, but the last one, or maybe the last couple of them, what we did was we went to the New Testament and we started looking for examples of this reality that we saw with uh, what, what Jeremiah is saying, you know, uh, submit to Babylon and they're rebelling and that's not resisting the devil. That's resisting God. That's resisting God. And, um, and we saw the same thing with Assyria coming and Isaiah said, you know, you know, we need to submit to this. We need to be with him, as it were, in this same spirit that he wants for the purpose that he's bringing about. Uh, what purpose would that be, Randy? Uh, you know, uh, that he might, uh, uh, after you've suffered for a while, uh, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Well, all of that, all of the definitions of that are in his mind, in his heart. We go, well, I'm settled. I'm a Christian. I'm not just a Christian. I'm a preacher. Or I'm, you know, I'm somebody that knows stuff. Uh, I, know more than, I know more than most of the people in my church, you know. Well, okay. <laughs> do, you, do you know, you know, do you know more than, than Isaiah or, or Jeremiah or David or whatever? Well, no, we'll never know more than them. Well, why not? I mean... They lived, that was the Old Testament, the Old Covenant times. Why can't we just give everything, give all and go and just, this is what I want. This is what my life stands for. To know you in this way, to glorify Christ crucified, to allow the Lamb uh, uh, not just to lay down his life for me, but lay down his life in me. For the people that are least deserving, the evildoers. So, um, my my um, bridge here said, notice in all these examples, the enemy is God's tool to get Christ crucified out of them. Compare Isaiah 10 with 2 Corinthians 4. And see, we didn't even do that one. Um, but, but we need to look at, Isaiah 10 verse. So Isaiah chapter 10. And here we begin to see that just as Babylon during Jeremiah's time and Isaiah's time, Assyria was just a tool. In verse 5 of chapter 10. 
O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. Okay, so this is God, this is this is them coming. Even you know, see, we say, well, God wouldn't use somebody unrighteous. Well, you know, Book of Esther, he used Haman, and you know, on and on and on. I mean, there are just so many examples. Yeah, he will, he will, because we're so completely convinced of how spiritual we are, just like Israel was in in. In Isaiah's time, all the way up to Jeremiah's, how spiritual we are, how how stable we already are, how together we have it. That um, why would God, you know, God wouldn't want to use somebody, you know, that that's just the devil or that's just evil people. Um, God's not as concerned about evil people or the devil as you might think he is. He's way more concerned about our hearts, just like he was in Isaiah's time and Jeremiah's, and as we'll see in Ezekiel's part in that whole thing, which was, which was at the same time with Jeremiah, but a very different thing was working in those in his book. Um, so then in verse 7 through 11, God says that Assyria does not know they are his instrument. What? Did Babylon, did Nebuchadnezzar know he was God's instrument? No. But he did catch wind of Jeremiah's saying stuff. And he thought, well, you know, I must be God's instrument. You, you know a little bit about um Nebuchadnezzar and some of the stuff he went through, don't you? His pride and God had to bring him down and make him a beast and or not make him a beast, show him that he already was a beast and, <clears throat> you know, which God would love to do with us. And then from that go, oh my God, I want to know you in truth and true heart. And I want it to be about you instead of me learning something that I can impress people. And they go, where'd you get all that knowledge from? So, um, in uh, starting in verse 7 of Isaiah 10, again, that Syria doesn't even know they're God's uh, instrument. In fact, they think they're great and they're unstoppable and... Uh, the only thing in their heart is to destroy others. But God is still using them, regardless of their, who by wicked hands have done whatever, still using them for in, a, in alignment with the determinant counsel of God. All right, so here we go, verse 7. Um, again, Isaiah 10. How be it? He meaneth not so, meaning he, does, he, he doesn't really acknowledge the fact that he's a rod of mine, as, as he said in verse 7. He doesn't, uh, uh, yeah, verse 5, I mean. Um, God saying he's rod of mine. However, he meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. For he saith, are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Cano as Car, uh, Carmish? Excuse me. You know, I can every time I get to that name, I know the name and I cannot pronounce it properly. Uh, Carmish. Anyway, is not Hamath or Arpath? Is not Samaria as Damascus? Meaning, is not this next town going to be just like the one I crushed? over here that's what he's saying every time he names one he says, and are they not like the one that we're coming to are they not like this because i'm so powerful and so good and, you know as far as uh, you know my strategies and everything like that <clears throat> um uh as my hand hath found the kingdom uh found the kingdoms of the idols and whose graven images did excel them 
of Jerusalem and of Samaria, shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols? Okay, so you have, you have an evildoer that is a true evildoer. See, we can't seem to get over that. Well, that's unfair. You know, I'm better than them. I mean, you know, the, the little sissy example I use regularly on that one is when when they came to take Jesus away and, and Peter pulled out a sword to protect Jesus and cut off a guy's ear, Jesus didn't rebuke the guy who came in and said, see, you know, I had him cut your ear off because you don't hear. You don't have a clue what I'm like. You're here to crucify me, and I'm the Son of God. He, he didn't say that at all. He turned to Peter and said, Dude, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. If you live by the Lamb, you're going to die by the Lamb. And, I, and it says, if Jesus is going... I am going to raise my hand to this. I could call 10,000 angels, but I'm going to go through this to the glory of the Father in a right spirit. All right, so, um, so in verses 12 through 13, God declares that after he is finished, so we're going to, we're going to read that in just a second. In verses 12 through 13, God declares that after God is finished with Assyria as his tool, and after God's work upon Mount Zion to bring them there in spirit, that he will punish Assyria for its arrogance. Well, for those of you who know any, any portion of um, the book of Jeremiah, you know that's going to happen to them too. In fact, when we were going through it, there was a, there was a sort of a paragraph at the bottom of one of the chapters that said, okay, you know what? Don't don't worry about don't worry about them. I'll take care of them in due season. But right now I'm dealing with you through them. Now will you let me deal with you through them? You know, we go, well, okay. As long as you get them. As long as you get that evil door, yeah. You know, it's a shame we'd even have to be told that. I mean, it shows where our heart is. You know, well, I'm still righteous. I'm still, and they're not. Well, Jesus was righteous, and nobody around him, when they hung him on a cross, was righteous. They all had wrong motives, and he didn't, he didn't take score. He didn't look around and try to figure out, you know, the Bible says there's none righteous. No, you know, I wonder if, I wonder if, the Lord was saying, there's none righteous, and one person starts to lift his hand, and he goes, and God says, no, not one. Yes, Lord. <clears throat> All right, so let's read, uh, let's read verse 12 through um, 13. Um, still in Isaiah chapter 10. Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work, upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem. In other words, that's his goal. That's where he's, that's his point. That's his focus. That He has blinders that he's not seeing everything else right. At, uh, you know, it's like, it's like, as long as I'm dealing with you, I don't even see them. Much less see them so bad I need to quit dealing with you and deal with them. I want my Son, out of you, that's my heart. That's my heart. And so he's, he's saying, well, when it come to pass, when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria, the evildoer, and the glory of his high looks. Well, I mean, think about it. This sounds a little, little bit like Paul in First, Second Corinthians twelve. 
because of the abundance of revelation, I was puffed up instead of humbled and, and going, oh my God, Jesus, you're so big. It's like, I'm really seeing a lot of great stuff and that makes me really special. God says, okay, you know. Uh, he looks around and goes, let's see, should it be uh, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon? Nah, nah, let's see. Uh, sh maybe a certain, nah. Satan, come here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I got a job for you. One of my own thinks they're pretty pretty special. <clears throat> All right. So, and then verse uh, 13. For he saith, By the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent, and I have removed the bounds of the people, meaning I've, I've removed the, the uh, boundaries of nations and made it more my nation. I'm bigger. I'm bigger because I beat up little nations. I'm so special. Um, and have robbed their treasures, and I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. Did you have uh, your phone open in case somebody's trying to call? Because I'm getting a million texts coming in right here. Somebody's saying they can't hear me for the last hour. <laughs> Sorry. Is is everybody hearing me out there? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right. <clears throat> um, so, uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to this. I'll close with this. We're going over just a little bit, but please just let me read. If nothing else, let me just read now. 2 Corinthians, but not chapter 12 this time. 2 Corinthians, but not chapter 12 this time. It's chapter 4, and we'll go 7 through 12, and then we'll go 16 through 18. So 2 Corinthians 4, starting with verse 7, in thinking in line with what we just read. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Can you see that when you, you know, the, the evildoer will do stuff to you, man. It'll trouble you. It'll mess with you. It'll, it'll cause you to go through stuff. But if you understand why you're in the corridor and what, what God really, really wants out of you, then... You, you can be troubled on every side, but not distressed. You're, you're like, look, I'm with the Lord. I'm going to be with the Lord in this. I'm going to show him the, that his son, the lamb, is on, enthroned inside of me. And not just someday on a throne that I get to go, hey, hey, yeah. You know, and, you know, remember those fiery eyes that he has in the book of Revelation? You're going, hey, <laughs> what? He goes, I didn't see a lot of lamb. What are you shouting right here, you know? <laughs> well, you saved me. Well, that's not what this is about. Anyway, this is a celebration of life in all of us. All right. Um, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Why? Because we're bearing about something in the trial. All, uh, um, always bearing about in the body. This isn't in the mind or in the doctrines. Bearing about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that, that, so that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in my mortal body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life, remember what we were reading in the other, in, in 1 Peter, uh, uh, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh, so then death worketh in us, but life 
in you. Now, verse 16, for which cause we faint not. This is, it is because we understand this. We understand that this isn't just the devil or just sufferings or just going through stuff. We have a better view of it. We actually understand more of the Bible than just Jesus walking around, you know, healing and casting out demons. We understand what, what all this really is about. Therefore, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perisheth, <laughs> yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction. You see, he calls it light affliction because it's not heavy in the sense of I'm just wrestling with it. Half of the affliction is how we deal with it. Really, I mean, you know, we have affliction. You know, it's like there's a, it's like the disciples. There's a storm outwardly, and they're in the boat, and then there's the storm on the storms on the inside of them, and they made the storm twice as bad and brought more storm. And they're going, you know, Jesus, wake up, stop being at rest, get up here, man. Carest thou not that we perish? <laughs> So, um, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but we look at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. In Jesus' name, don't we have another class coming up here right after this? So, Revelation's coming up, so I'm going to pray and get out of here, get out of your life. Father, I thank you for these that are hungry, that love you, that seek you, that, Father, we have, we have those that desire to look into those things that your men and women went through, the sufferings of Christ. We know the angels do that. But we want to look into them and we want to be a partaker of it. Father, you said in Romans, we have not just been blessed to, to, to um, be saved, but to suffer with you. Help us to understand that. Help us to understand most of the New Testament and what it's truly declaring. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, keep eating the word. Bless you.